You guys hear me? Hi. Uh, thank you for um, attending our uh, 5.30 presentation today. Um, realize it's late, but you know, just be patient and then you can go have the drinks outside uh, for the happy hour. Uh, so today's presentation is about uh, tuning OpenStack uh, for availability and performance in um, large production environments. And uh, my name is Gabriel. Um, I uh, work for Symantec and I'm part of uh, the cloud platform engineering team. And um, we're building a consolidated cloud platform um, that provides um, platform um, and infrastructure services for um, the next generation of Symantec uh, products. And uh, <coughs> a little bit about uh, my, myself, my background. Um, I have uh, about 10 ex more than 10 years of experience in uh, large scale uh, production environments, um, and I've been uh, uh, doing OpenStack from probably 2011 for about three, three years. And uh, at Symantec, uh, uh, we're um, doing that, uh, and I'm part of a great team and really excited. <laughs> uh, this is uh, our agenda today. Um, we don't have time to cover all the topics we wanted to, but um, here are some of the topics that we're going to be covering. So we're going to start with um, talking about uh, what large scale means for us and um, what high availability means for us. Um, we're going to talk about um, a little bit about infrastructure lifecycle and how we deploy and provision boxes and uh, also about uh, configuration management and uh, some, some about orchestration. Um, the next topic is going to be about uh, how we've integrated the uh, uh, Keystone and the auth services with our uh, enterprise directory, uh, which is LDAP. Um, the next uh, topic is going to be about Keystone and um, securing Keystone and uh, about PKI tokens. Uh, my colleague Raj is going to come in later and um, he's going to uh, talk about Nova and uh, some of the KVM tunings and also the database uh, tunings, um, and um, uh, lastly, the uh, RabbitMQ cluster. So let's get started. Um, so first of all, what is uh, a, a large-scale production? I mean, what is a large-scale environment uh, uh, means? So uh, what we consider to be a large-scale. So first of all, uh, it would have to be um, spanned through multiple data centers. Um, it, it, it will have thousands of hypervisors, um, tens of thousands of VMs, and uh, uh, millions of requests per, per minute to your uh, API um, endpoints. And obviously these numbers are, uh, they will vary based on um, your, the sizes of your hypervisors or, or, or your VMs. In other words, if your VMs are you know, very large VMs, you're going to have a l uh, lower number. Same thing with a hypervisor. A hypervisor that uh, is, you know, 12 cores and 64 gig is going to be a lot different than one that has 40 cores and 2 terabytes. So these numbers are uh, will, will vary. Uh, what about high availability? Uh, what What is high availability to, and we're talking about the control plane here. Um, so we're aiming to have a uh, uh, four nines of high availability for our control plane, and we think we can achieve that number. Um, and the way we have uh, done this is to, uh, first of all, our control plane is uh, virtualized and is distributed among failure zones, so we don't have anything running in a single failure domain. Uh, we use hardware load balancers um, that you know come in pair pairs between uh, uh, in the front of all our uh, services and um, the next rule is um, uh, you know about the um, separation of your network so I don't know how many people here have had issues with spanning tree uh, because okay so I, I've had some issues as well and I, I remember those nights uh, so spanning trees uh, it's good, but uh, the problems that come with it uh, are really ugly. So the rule is no spanning tree across availability zones. And so each one of our availability zones is uh, L3, single L3 domain. <coughs> the next thing is you should uh, 
go with redundant power and redundant network connectivity and pretty much everything redundant as much as uh, you know budget allows you to, to do so. And to uh, give an example I uh, put here, uh, one of our hypervisors, um, how it's configured. And um, as you see, we have um, <coughs> multiple um, redundant 10 gig NICs. And um, so 10 gig NICs uh, today should be pretty much on board on any <coughs> infrastructure, on any enterprise class hardware uh, server. And um, the cost per port uh, has come down and it's probably not going to go up. So you should have a redundancy where you can. Um, so uh, as you can see, we're running in an active-active um, mode with LACP and we're sending multiple uh, VLANs. We're, we're running trunk ports and we're sending multiple VLANs to uh, the hypervisors. Again, these VLANs do not span between uh, racks, so they're completely isolated to the, to the rack. And uh, also very important, have your uh, management interface completely separated so you can always uh, go and um, if something goes wrong you can always do go and manage your system uh, there um, so the next thing is the um, um, infrastructure life cycle and you know how do we provision boxes and how do we uh, manage these uh, systems uh, at this time we're using uh, foreman <coughs> to provision our boxes and um, uh, at the end of the provisioning, we have uh, we're classifying the uh, systems in, in different classes, and then um, that classification uh, ends up being used by Puppet. And um, for example, if it's a, a, a compute node uh, or if it's a, a storage node, Puppet applies different sets of uh, modules. Um, and about um, uh, Puppet, uh, at this time we're using, uh, uh, we, we have switched to a masterless uh, Puppet setup. We have used uh, Puppet with you know, regular ma uh, servers in the past, and although we have had some issues with scalability of it, um, that was not the reason we switched away. Um, I mean, there were many reasons, but I, I think the mostly is because of it gives us more flexibility uh, all our Puppet code is uh, in Git, and we have a very uh, uh, easy way to uh, pull these modules and apply them. Uh, and the other thing is we can do so on a very large number of systems at the sa same time. Previously, we, we, we were having issues running a Puppet job on, let's say, 2,000 boxes at the same time. That was a problem. Puppet servers we're having a problem doing that. So without Puppet servers, that's not a problem anymore. And uh, we use, uh, for orchestration, we use uh, Salt and, and Fab uh, as well. Um, a little bit about um, enterprise directories and OpenStack. So you build a cloud and um, you want your users to start using it. So what are these users? Uh, chances are, if 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 it's a if it's a large production environment, your users are somewhere. They're either in some sort of active directory or they're in uh, in in an LDAP directory. In our case, we we had both. So now the question is, which one you use? Um, active directory. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just that in most of the uh, enterprises or organizations. Um, it's usually handled by IT. It's owned by IT. And uh, you know our IT department is great, and they're doing a really good job. It's just that uh, you know their priorities are sometimes slightly different than ours. Our job is to keep the site up, and their job is to have our computers and our email and everything else working. So when you have a problem, you know you might have to file a ticket, and you don't want to do that. Um, so um, LDAP was there, and um, LDAP has been LDAP is a uh, you know standard that has been around for 20 plus years. Uh, it's free; you don't have to pay anything. Uh, LDAP is um, perfect because it has uh, built-in replication. It has built-in um, uh, synchronization of data. It's the perfect directory for uh, read-only queries. 
which is exactly what you want. That's exactly what Keystone does. Um, so that that's why we went with uh, with that with LDAP. And the other thing is you you can you, be, because you control the infrastructure, you can design it so it fits your your needs as far as load and performance as well. Um, <coughs> so at this time we have used um, LDAP only for identity. We we kept the assignment in. SQLs in MySQL, like stuff like uh, tenants and projects and uh, uh, domains are still in uh, MySQL. So uh, LDAP is a read-only uh, directory, so uh, people sometimes make it read-write and they think they should uh, go and create users from uh, Keystone and don't do that. Leave, uh, that for, leave that problem for something like identity management or Pretty much everybody should have a system of getting their users on board and don't get into that. Uh, so use it as a read-only. Um, the next thing is the se security of um, this connection between Keystone and LDAP. Make sure it's using uh, uh, LDAP S. And uh, I've seen sometimes people use just regular LDAP on port 389 thinking that, oh, this is going to be TLS. But t the truth is TLS sometimes can be uh, it cannot be enforced all the time, so if you're just using uh, LDAP, as you're sure that your uh, credentials are going to be um, sent encrypted. Also, uh, work with, with your LDAP administrator, create a special user for Keystone <laughs> to bind to LDAP, and uh, set, set the right permissions for this user to uh, allow this user to access only the uh, right OUs and um, that will uh, uh, that will give you a lot of uh, leverage when you have um, um, problems with the LDAP directory, and there your LDAP administrator will be able to uh, pinpoint these problems. This is a, a diagram that shows what I've said before: uh, the end-to-end -end, uh, encryption of, of your credentials. And my colleague yesterday had a presentation on. Keystone, and she brought some of uh, these things uh, up already. But um, make sure that all the links in, in, in the path uh, of the credentials are being uh, addressed. Uh, for example, uh, how do people talk to Keystone? Um, so one way is to, uh, through a GUI, through Horizon, for example. Another way is through a Keystone client or through uh, curl, uh, direct API calls. So you want to put uh, you want to first of all you want your Keystone endpoint to be secure. So uh, use HTTPS there, and then um, Horizon uh, as well. HTTPS on your Horizon interface, and maybe like a redirect rule that will um, have people use it. And we have already uh, talked about the um, connection between Keystone and LDAP that is also um, uh, encrypted. So. By doing this, you are sure that uh, at any time uh, the, the credentials are uh, protected. Uh, this is another picture that uh, shows a more detailed diagram on how uh, Keystone and uh, uh, has been implemented, how the security on Keystone has been implemented. So as you see, we are using load balancers, uh, and we have split the uh, LDAP, the, we have split the Keystone uh, and the Keystone admin into two VIPs because we wanted to use, we wanted to take the port out of the URL to make it easier for everybody to just say HTTPS, Keystone, and the rest of the domain, and that's the endpoint. Uh, no ports, so um, there's a port translation happening on the load balancer, um, and um, as you see, we're using on our Keystone servers, uh, we're using self-signed certificates versus the trusted CA signed certificates on the user-facing ones. And uh, somebody asked yesterday, why do we do this encryption here since the data is already encrypted? And the reason is sometimes um, uh, the compliance, uh, uh, for because of the compliance rules, uh, if the information is passing from a more secure zone to a more secure zone through different other zones, the information needs to be encrypted. So it was not a big deal. Um, we used Apache with the mod WSGI and mod SSL, uh, self-signed certificates. Then on the load balancer, um, 
you know, client SSL and server SSL profiles. And uh, the discussion of uh, which certificates you should use, signed or self-signed, uh, remember, it's always about user experience. You want your users to not feel any difference when they come and use your cloud than from the, they go and use a different public cloud. Like I, I haven't seen anybody complaining that I've got a warning certificate mismatch when they go to use a public cloud. That's never going to happen. So why should it should happen uh, for, you, for yours, right? So always uh, customer-facing. Uh, VIPs use the trusted CAs. So um, we're going to talk about uh, Keystone and uh, PKI tokens uh, next. So I was curious uh, how, how many uh, from here have been using uh, PKI tokens or are using PKI tokens? OK. <laughs> so not very many. So the question is, why should I use PKI tokens? Why should I just not stick with UID tokens? Because, you know, they work. There's nothing wrong with them. Um, <coughs> the problem uh, with UID tokens is that when uh, somebody requests a token from Keystone, they authenticate. Uh, they're getting this token. Uh, this token will have to be sent to a different component, and it will have to be validated by that component. And then that component will have to contact Keystone. Keystone will have to validate the component, and then it's going to have to reply back with OK or a list of more information. So every time that happens, Keystone is being queried. Uh, when you have a, a really large environment, Keystone is going to suffer because of this. So then you switch to uh, PKI. So PKI, uh, what's happening is uh, Keystone um, sends you this token in, a, uh, in an encoded format. It pretty much takes the JSON file that has this information, and it encodes it, and then it's signing this information. So the client uh, pulls the certificate that was used to sign the token, and it can validate the token without contacting Keystone again. And that's very important because it pretty much takes this call out of the, uh, it never talks to Keystone again. Um, there's some uh, misconception there about, uh, oh, I switched to PKI tokens. My tokens are very secure, um, and nobody can see the tokens. The tokens are not encrypted. The tokens are only signed, and they're encoded. Anybody can take the token and decode it with Base64, and they can look at it. So remember that. Is tokens are not encrypted. They're signed. Um, so there's a certificate uh, expiration. There's a client uh, that can validate this, the expiration on the signature. And then make sure you, uh, th there were some problems before with the revocation list, uh, but they should be fixed by now. Um, so uh, it's, all, it's not all good with PKA tokens, because otherwise, I guess, more people um, would have uh, used them. So there's some problems, um, uh, mostly related with, uh, for us, we have had some issues with um, the, the Keystone uh, catalog size. So for one reason or the other, our uh, master catalog size had, had grew uh, more than it should have. And um, sometimes when um, people request a scope token, uh, this uh, catalog has to be uh, encoded into the token. And uh, what's happening is we have seen that because of that, um, uh, this token gets passed uh, out in the header of the HTTP request, and a lot of components have issues with larger header size. So uh, one of the options that you need to uh, make sure to make sure it's being um, looked at was this max header line uh, option that uh, I think it has been bumped from the default 8K to 16K in some components, from what I remember. But to be sure, we have bumped it to uh, 32K. And uh, also, uh, you know, uh, newer uh, mod uh, WSIG um, has a specific option to deal with this. And also, uh, very important, um, talk to your users and have them um, use no catalog when they request a token if they don't need to have the catalog in the token. 
sometimes they they do not need it and they don't know about this option um, so that they can um, request it and um, I think um, at this point I, I would ask to keep your questions for the end when we're going to have a Q&A and at this time I'll have to um, uh, let my colleague Raj to uh, come and talk more about uh, Nova and these other things. Thanks. Thanks, Gabe. Thanks, Gabe. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Raj. Um, I work in uh, cloud platform engineering uh, in Symantec. Uh, my background is on uh, uh, operations and infrastructure, um, um, and I've been working with OpenStack for the past uh, like two and a half, three years. Uh, so uh, one of the important aspects um, before I start uh, is like I want to ask people um, how many of, of the people here using uh, Nova API behind Apache? No one? No one? Okay. Not bad. So uh, one of the crucial important things that we, uh, we saw f uh, related to performance especially is uh, there's nothing wrong uh, Nova API using uh, existing uh, Python even let's. But when you get uh, lots of requests, and especially uh, Gabe mentioning, uh, my colleague mentioning about the PK token, the header size increasing, you'll definitely is going to hit the performance. And uh, most of the things that we see is like, all right, this performance issue, let me scale the workers. And um, you can't, you keep on scale them, but you're not going to give, uh, uh, get the performance uh, better the throughputs uh, from the API services. So Apache has been proven uh, to do these web services uh, well, uh, better handle. And uh, the other reason also, we thought to use Apache because uh, we want to make sure every layer of OpenStack is being encrypted and use SSL in the back end. Today we don't um, use that uh, SSL for, uh, for Nova, but uh, we have plans and uh, if you see here, we have commented that out, but uh, we are, we're working on that. Um, uh, by using uh, Nova API behind Apache, uh, uh, the differences that we saw being uh, eight uh, workers with uh, Python Evitlets and uh, with uh, three processes with Apache is going to uh, serve it. So you see a significant difference. Uh, here is a test uh, config files that uh, we use today. Uh, one is for Apache uh, configuration um, to, uh, to make the virtual host and uh, to enable the ports. The other is to for uh, Apache uh, Mod WS uh, SGI, uh, the script uh, to invoke the Nova API service. Uh, feel free to use this uh, and then um, try um, in your labs um, and see the difference, and you'll definitely see a significant difference. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I'm not going to touch more on Nova scheduler because we use our own custom scheduling, and most of the people, I guess, are also uh, using their own custom scheduling for their own workloads. Uh, so uh, I'm going to skip to uh, Nova Conductor. How many people doesn't use Nova Conductor? And I think everyone uses, so it works for you guys, good. Uh, one of the important aspects uh, about Nova Conductor is uh, it's been recently added in Grizzly. It's a great idea to uh, bring security, uh, 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 it, it's been added because to bring security in place, not uh, Nova uh, compute talking to uh, database directly, uh, that's one of the major aspects that it was being uh, introduced. Saying that, um, uh, uh, but still, Nova Compute has been co uh, compromised with the MySQL access because if you're using Nova API metadata, you still, need my, you still need MySQL database access, or if you're using any volumes, like Cinder, it still needs uh, MySQL database. So apparently, it's not solving everyone's problem, but it's a good idea to start using that. Uh, but we see some performance issues uh, by uh, bringing Nova Conductor into the picture. Um, people say that, yes, you can uh, mitigate this problem by scaling it out. But at the same time, I'm scaling out my database, and I have to scale this out uh, for no reason, because I'm not getting any advantage today. Maybe I get advantage tomorrow. Maybe I should uh, think about it. So uh, to mitigate, the, uh, mitigate that and uh, to get better performance, we actually disable Nova Conductor. And that's how it looks the flow. Uh, and it's not the default behavior anymore. Uh, you have to uh, put a configuration option in the Nova.compute um, to disable that. And I'm pretty sure that you're going to see significant difference uh, in your performance uh, because you're not going to have one more uh, layer. Uh, because if you see Nova Conductor uh, talks to Rabbit message and then it talks to database, uh, and uh, it, you will have a massive uh, 
uh, issues of uh, bottlenecks uh, with this and also have a, a one, one more uh, step. So to do that uh, in the config file, um, use uh, uh, an option called use uh, local equal to true and then our compute. Uh, people uh, uh, who, who doesn't have MySQL configuration, make sure before you use this option, configure your uh, MySQL options, like uh, put your uh, MySQL web, use any password and database uh, information there uh, so that you're not going to get uh, added out from the compute node. Uh, and this is one of the important things that we want to share. Um, and also we're trying to actively s uh, work with the community to see like what is the best uh, we can uh, do to scale out and maybe better idea for securing um, the database access. Um, so uh, the next uh, important thing is also, uh, we said it's performance training on OpenStack and uh, it turns into like KVM kind of tightly uh, being integrated with OpenStack nowadays because the only uh, people by default when you say OpenStack, people also uh, point to the KVM um, for virtualization. Uh, we did have done, uh, I'm not going to talk about, there are a lot of uh, performance tunings in KVM, but I'm not going to talk uh, everything here. But we want to share a little bit what uh, we have done, uh, which are the major components that, uh, that gives value, adds value uh, to your uh, existing cluster and workloads. Um, one other thing is uh, uh, KSM, Canal uh, same page uh, merging. This actually helps you uh, to get, uh, to share your uh, identical memory pages uh, among different processes or uh, virtual guest uh, in a virtual host. It's into in, in a single virtual host. Uh, this is actually also so critical if people are doing um, their uh, resourcing, uh, like uh, the provisioning resources like the work commitment, like uh, having increased your uh, vCPUs and memories, uh, especially memory, uh, will help a lot. And also, this is not a tough thing, but it's it's about the thing that we might be forgetting to install a package and uh, turn the service on. There are services that, is, that take care of this. So in uh, in uh, rel based uh, versions, it's uh, KSM tune D is the process. Make sure that it's turned on, and it's an Ubuntu uh, KSM D. Um, make sure it's turned on and it'll follow. It'll, the process will take care of the rest of the following uh, uh, steps that it's going to take here. I'm not going to go much details there um, because it's a straightforward thing. Um, the next important thing is uh, transparent huge pages. Uh, I think everyone talks about it and it's so important because it also gives benefit um, not only host uh, but also guest. Uh, by saying that, you have to also keep in mind uh, that the value of the host uh, should be always, uh, the value of the, uh, in the guest uh, should be always less than the host uh, because um, you're going to uh, not gain much performance if, you, if the value is uh, much increased. And, uh, and also uh, to make it enable, uh, here is, a, here is a, a command to uh, make it uh, enable, uh, but if it's always disabled. Uh, and you s if you cat on that file, you see like it's never, so make it always to make it enabled. Um, the, other, the other thing is also uh, add this uh, uh, configuration parameter in your uh, libboard XML file for a uh, guest uh, operating system to take advantage of it. And there are other parameters that you can tune. And number, uh, we're not uh, really sharing the number here, what we're using, because it's kind of a test and tune. Uh, it's based on your workloads. So um, you can you can use the default, maybe some, some people uh, uses the default value, which is which works great for them, but some people may not. So, um, so the next thing is uh, block hyper, the I/O scheduler, uh, especially um, one of the major important thing by from the default uh, behavior uh, CFS. Uh, we moved to deadline. Uh, it it gave us a, a significant performance uh, increase uh, when we use uh, QCOC images, especially. Uh, it doesn't match with the raw. Uh, but still, um, it's 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 a little bit performance uh, increase uh, by doing that, uh, and also keep in mind, uh, and also uh, if, if the same team dealing with the guest and the host, it's okay if, if there are two different teams that are dealing uh, in the infrastructure side. Make sure that uh, coordinate because if the value is being already configured at the host level, and if you're trying to do on the guest, uh, you're going to have a worse performance rather than having a best performance. So uh, the other aspect also, we have been seen uh, uh, 
and also we have been uh, uh, bit by it is because enabling cache equal to none make sure because it's not default uh, in the OpenStack, it's not default uh, in the config XML file, and I will equal to native um, adds more value. The reason because you already have uh, a caching drive in the back end of the hard drive which takes care of the things and you don't have to do uh, a game uh, which gives you worse performance. Uh, that's, that's more about uh, the major three things that um, we actually looked at uh, um, and we want to share that in the configs and the, uh, the comments uh, about uh, KVM. Uh, the next one is uh, database. It is kind of tricky um, uh, because uh, database is always uh, a pain point uh, in every aspect. Uh, uh, the thing is people talk about like how do I replicate, do I have to do multi-master, master-slave, how do I do reads, how do I uh, do writes. Um, so uh, one of the approach we take is uh, we, we use a standard model uh, of uh, Galera replication. Uh, we have a three node cluster and it's, it's not always uh, Ideal because based on your size of the uh, and your workloads, you can always increase and make sure it's odd number always uh, for a split brain mechanism. Um, so we use uh, uh, WS wrap, which is the right set replication. Um, uh, we put the uh, we enable uh, the error replication behind the load balancer, which is taken care of, uh, and we have a web that all clients uh, connect to the web. Uh, we initially try to make uh, these three nodes are uh, are are all active, and uh, we try to make it to write to all nodes, um, and we had problem, and then what we start is like, make one node write, make sure that it's committed to both nodes, and then read from all the nodes, uh, and so we're d differentiating the workloads between write and reads to get better performance. Um, and uh, talking a little bit of Galeria, Galeria is in um, data-centric approach, that means uh, every node has its own unique ID, and uh, the rule of thumb here is the node belongs to data, data doesn't belong to node. That means data is not part of node. It, it, it exists everywhere. So no uh, head cache or increment as uh, legacy MySQL uh, uh, replication does here. It doesn't do that uh, anymore. So uh, we want to share our configuration here too because it might add value uh, for everyone. Um, what are the values that we do uh, for our cluster with three node? How does it uh, increase? So. We have been like uh, testing with the massive workloads and increasing each individual performance tune uh, for each individual configuration option and then tune them to our workloads. But uh, it also depends of your workloads. But this works perfect for us. Feel free to uh, use it and test and uh, see. Um, the other thing uh, is there is always uh, software. You always have limitations. Everything is not perfect. So the most uh, important thing is uh, it supports only uh, inodeDB um, and make sure that your database uh, is been using inodeDB and uh, primary key is must um, without primary key please not do not even try uh, using a data cluster and make them. that can be fixed uh, the schema can be fixed uh, if you can spend uh, some time on the on your schema which we have done a few times um, and also a commit latency which is another one that we said like when we make it all active, that's what we uh, actually ran into problem with commit latency uh, because of different workloads and reading and all these things. So that's the reason we made one uh, master and then the rest, uh, like it's a persistent connection behind the web. One master gets all the connections and then when it fails down, then only it goes to the uh, second or third masters. And we do have a custom uh, scripts behind the load balancer that checks whether the node is in the cluster or does is not in the cluster. We have a separate user that is being created to MySQL that we use that to check that uh, nodes. Uh, the other thing is uh, doesn't like huge transitions. It doesn't like to put like a really huge transitions and deadlocks and commit uh, is always uh, a problem with all the databases, not only MySQL, but it's uh, one of the limitations. Uh, that said, this is this is what um, or few limitations there few more, but these are the major limitations that uh, we uh, we see uh, from, from from our side. Um, that said, uh, now uh, we'll kind of uh, switching to uh, RabbitMQ. Uh, this is one of the coolest things, so uh, I just uh, wrote it down. Rabbit is used to be uh, using for cartoons, and now it started using for uh, as a data queues. Um, so 
So RabbitMQ, uh, what can RabbitMQ do for us, or for you, uh, for everyone uh, in the OpenStack cluster? Um, the one of the important aspects people always forget is uh, there are a lot of differences between Rabbit 2.x and 3.x. Uh, we use 3.x. Uh, it's been improved a lot, uh, especially it has a native clustering mechanism in order to use uh, PageMaker and Chorusync, which I saw a lot of operations guide. Uh, this, uh, but you know, to do that, we try to contribute that to uh, have this documented there too. And uh, it has a high available queues. That means uh, by default, the queues are not um, part of the cluster. Uh, you have to enable uh, the HA uh, policy on the queues. Uh, don't forget that, but that's that's one of the most thing. People create the clusters, but forget to run that command. Um, and also, it has the latest implementations for the MQB protocol 0 0.9 and 1. 1.0 1 came recently, which has a lot of uh, cool features, uh, especially connection pooling uh, for connection channels. Um, and federation is another important cool, uh, cool thing uh, that people can use it if you have an isolated uh, um, networks that you but you want to send the queue in different places. Um, you can use federation, you can set a policy that X queue go to uh, Y node, and then it automatically goes. Um, and it take, Rabbit take care of a good job there. And flexible routing uh, for the queues. So when a producer uh, puts a message to the exchange, and then uh, you have a flexible routing that you can enable uh, what kind of routing mechanism you want to use between exchange and queue. I'm not going to go much details with the uh, Rabbit uh, uh, subject here. It's a, it's a big one. Um, so this is how our uh, cluster looks like. Um, so we have uh, we have a cluster uh, with three nodes here. So the cluster automatically replicates all the exchange and its own data uh, and maintains uh, a long database. And uh, we have uh, a queue that is uh, that that got created in node one and got uh, replicated here uh, to um, node two and node three. And this is the same thing when a con con connection came here and if you create a uh, Q in node two, it's going to get replicated node uh, one and node three. So this is how our configuration uh, file looks like, and we would like to share that too, because most of the implementations uh, in my experience that I saw, uh, people run commands using their configuration management, but Rabbit pretty much, uh, you can put things in the configuration file, stay statically, so that you don't have to run or forget and uh, go with your craziness of configuration management. So you can say it once, uh, by rest every restart, it's going to read this configuration file and then uh, go with it. The other important thing uh, I said, like uh, you have to enable uh, the policy to uh, replicate the queues, I mean, uh, to have uh, mirrored the queues. So here is a command, this is what we do. So usually the, what we do is we usually add this command to the startup script itself because it's not going to harm anything if there is a policy already set, it's not going to do anything. If it's not, it's going to set the policy. We're making sure that it, it exists. Um, and usually when you plan for cluster, when you create a first node, you can run this command uh, on the first node so that when the node, one, node two and node three joins automatically, the queues will be mirrored. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's, uh, that's what it is. So uh, one of the other important thing that I want to share, why, uh, why we are using a VIP uh, uh, before the Rabbit cluster, people might be asking, um, OpenStack has an implementation having uh, HA queues uh, that you can put host, a list of hosts. It implements this with a for loop going node one, node two, node three. It always goes in a, uh, in a loop with node one, node two, node three, and we don't want to use that. Uh, reason because uh, it's a client implementation. It, it's, it works great, um, but at the same time, I'm not going to get, uh, 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 get it load balanced. I'm getting HA, but I'm not getting load balanced, so I want to use the uh, load balancing functionality in the Rabbit uh, so that I get better performance uh, by doing that. I'm not choking at one single uh, node because what happens when you have thousands of hypervisors, assume node one goes down, all the nodes are going to be node two. When it goes down, all the connections are going to be node three and you have a choke point there. Uh, some people uh, have seen um, the configuration management puts a logic, odd number hosts go to odd number node, even number goes to. Still, it's, it's how uh, you want to put a bit, but we use load balancers bec uh, because we do have a little bit of load balancers and uh, we do uh, whip. And uh, we also use uh, connection um, caching on the load balancers for connection pooling uh, to uh, give even better, uh, um, better performance. Um, 
and also make sure that you have keep alive uh, enabled on your uh, load balancer. It's a little bit uh, um, degrades your performance, but it's not that bad. Um, that's all about um, about RabbitMQ. Um, and thanks for uh, listening to us. And uh, any questions? And give yeah, welcome. So, uh, uh, you mean which manufacturer? Yeah, so the question is uh, what load balancer are we using? So, at this time we're using uh, A10, A10, but uh, any load balancer will work just we'll fine. Work just um, you can use uh, F5 or C Citrix. Uh, it's not specific to a, a vendor. I mean, to add to that, we have not tried HA proxy. Uh, we're planning to try that too, but we have not. In enterprise, usually you have hardware load balancers, so we're taking advantage of it. We are in Havana, and uh, uh, we are trying to upgrade to Ice House. We have not seen anything like that. Uh, uh, from day one, when we have uh, set up this cluster, we are using behind the load balancer and uh, make sure the keep alive is there. That's the one of the other. That's the reason it's there. But we have not seen any that kind of things. We see some of the timeouts uh, losing connections from the consumers, um, um, and it's uh, it's all about the one of the thing that OpenStack does with the loop is. Um, keep on check, but uh, it's all about the client implementation, right? How do you keep on check and connect back? Uh, that's the reason we have a keep alive enabled, uh, actually, to get uh, mitigated that. But uh, one of the things that once we noticed that we uh, actually did little hack, I would like to say, because we use that uh, configuration option on the config file of uh, every component. Where we use the same VIP, same VIP repeatedly. So this connection last was one still it going to try and try so we have not seen any specific RPC timeouts uh, and this is the single cluster that talks everything even RSDN and everything so we have not seen we have we uh, for that we actually use uh, to add to that uh, we use uh, stack stash which is a rack space project for uh, listening to the uh, notifications uh, we do track of that we have not seen any Thing like that because we keep on track every every minute what's going on on our cluster with notifications and we track the flow how it's going and where is the problem but we have not seen anything missing okay um, with uh, MySQL are you using load balancer int introspection to actually split your writes from your reads how are you how are you directing your writes specifically to one node uh, do you want to add that so we have tried uh, we have used that in the past with uh, f5. Um, you can write an I rule that will inspect the uh, SQL, SQL query, SQL. and then it can uh, direct the traffic uh, to specific nodes. And it you know where it's kind of makes load balance as a client server kind of thing. Uh, so uh, that's the reason it needs a uh, SQL uh, user to make sure that that what kind of uh, uh, commit it's coming up, it's an update or it's a, see what kind of SQL query that it reads, and then based on that it takes. So you are still using that on the A10 to say uh, these are writes and these are no, we, we don't. We don't use that do. at this time. Okay. Not at this time. Um, that's the reason we have made enable the persistent connection to one node right now and uh, leaving that, but we're focusing to go in that direction. Okay. Cool. So you guys cut out the um, Nova conductor. Yeah. Um, the community is really against the computes having DB access. Yes. Um, have you looked into increasing the efficiency in conductor versus cutting it out? Uh, good point, actually. Even uh, as we are a security company, uh, we are concerned about that. 
but conduct is not giving us value uh, in terms of even uh, even community is saying that it should not have access to MySQL, but uh, still I need my Nova API da metadata needs MySQL access. I'm not, it's not solving my problem. So rather than spending time in uh, uh, throwing there because it's not ready yet, we just cut it off. And we're probably going to uh, go we'll back and reconsider revisit this. It because we um, need that uh, security uh, to be there. So you guys are using Nova Networks still? No, we're not using No, okay. we're using SDN. Uh, but it's also not only about that, but also uh, if you use Cinder or anything, it, it requires MySQL connection from the community. Right. So still, it's not solving my problem. All right, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, so the question is, how do we split the... So as I said, uh, uh, our uh, um, control plane is all virtualized, and we have uh, uh, separate uh, um, domain failure domains uh, for the control uh, plane, and so uh, they're distributed among different uh, racks, and so they run on different hypervisors. So we're making sure that they don't run in the same rack, and they don't run on the same... Well, they cannot run on the same hypervisor, but if there's many services of the same kind in the same rack, they wouldn't be on the same hypervisors. So uh, one important thing is uh, our workloads of control plane is all virtualized. We don't, uh, we don't run on bare metals. Yeah. So uh, it's because to scale out, it's cloud. Uh, we want to like, eat our own dog food. One more question about RapidMU. Uh, I didn't follow. Did you say that you are using RapidMQ hosts parameter? Yes. To tweak. Okay. Yes, uh, because Instead of, of the timeouts, because uh, that we have not fixed that. Uh, still, it goes to the VIP, but it's going to the same VIP, and VIP, the load balance is going to take care about how the connection goes. Uh, and one thing I uh, didn't mention before, and I should have, was that we have uh, checks for the service for all these services on um, uh, the load balancer. So. All these services are being marked down if the service is not performing. So it's not only that the host is pingable and the TCP port the accepts port the connection. Uh, you also want to make sure that the service performs. Um, uh, and then the load, if it doesn't, the load balancer mark marks it down. So the client will never uh, see the Make payload. sure the service is, uh, is uh, enabled and uh, it's accessible by the user. That's, that's how we mark it up in the load balancer. Okay, thanks. Uh, the question is, do you monitor the queue and uh, node status? Uh, we do monitor the node status. Uh, we don't monitor the queue, but we monitor, uh, as I said, uh, by using Stacky, the flow of the queue for each and every request that's going on. The request ID has everything. So I would definitely, as you said, uh, if, you, if I see something is missing there, I definitely see that the notification has not been there. So I definitely see that, but we don't see, and we do monitor that. We don't go into the looking at the queue, but we look the notification and get the queue. And we save that into database for looking the history. How many queues we, I mean, how many requests we served, and how did it go, what's the time that it took. I think uh, so we're actually out of no time. No more questions. So, uh, uh, or you guys, uh, we can take one more question, you guys have anything. Or uh, we can talk about the beach. Yeah, just uh, we're going to be around, so if so you guys <laughs> have any more questions, uh, find us. Uh, thanks for uh, staying late. And thank you.